everyone. I'm Maria Tambori, Chair of the Board of the National Organization of Italian American Women. I'd like to wish each and every one of you a good evening or maybe a good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Yes, we're actually touching a lot of different time zones today. Um, and we have a cross section of our country. In addition to the two coasts of California and New York, we have attendees from states in the Midwest, including Kansas, Illinois, uh, Iowa, Florida, Washington State, Arizona, and even Canada, if you can believe that. So I guess we can say with certainty that this is truly a national event for both of our organizations. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this special program commemorating Women's History Month. And as you know, it's titled Woven Lives, Exploring Women's Needlework from the Italian Diaspora. We feel especially fortunate to have this virtual exhibit and talk presented by Mariana Gatto, co-founder and executive director of the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles, or IMLA. Mariana is an historian and author with two decades of experience in nonprofit leadership, education, and museums. She has served as director of the IMLA since 2010. Mariana wrote and co-curated the IMLA's award-winning permanent exhibition. And she oversees educational programming, temporary ex ex exhibitions, I can't keep wanting to say exhibit, um, grant writing, and major gifts, which are among her many projects. Mariana's research focuses on Italian Americans in the West. She was awarded the Cavaliere dell'Ordine della Stella d'Italia, or in English, the Knight of the Order of the Star of Italy. And of course, she was awarder, awarded this award by the Italian Republic in 2021. We are delighted to be collaborating with Mariana and the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles on this unique program, which examines the significance of needlework in Italian American culture. So without further delay, I present Mariana Gatto. Mariana. Thank you, Maria, and to all the members of NOIA um, and the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles joining us this evening. I'm going to take a moment just to share my screen and us, and then we can get started on the presentation. Uh, let's see. Can everybody see that? Does everybody see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay, what? So for most people, the term needlework conjures images of dust, a dusty pile of doilies at a thrift shop or a gaudy yarn blanket on grandma's couch. In a world of mass production in which we purchase identical goods made by anonymous workers overseas, needlework has come to symbolize a lost art and a vestige of the past. Needlework, beyond its utilitarian uses, played an integral role in the lives of Italian immigrant women. It was a means through which women gained financial independence and helped support their families. Needlework also served as a vehicle through which women could express themselves, create communities, transmit knowledge, establish trades, weave together bifurcated identities, and preserve traditions. It is this topic that we explore in the latest temporary exhibition at the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles. From the simple to the ornate, the utilitarian to the sacred, the objects showcased in this exhibition reveal the sensibilities, hopes, beliefs, and perspectives of the various generations of women who fabricated them. By exploring the stories behind these handcrafted pieces, we gain a richer appreciation, not only for the experiences of their creators, but for how traditions survive, change, disappear, and reemerge in immigrant and transplanted communities. 
Woven Lives began as a mere musing in 2019. That summer, the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles, or IMLA, with the assistance of an intern funded through the Getty Marrow Undergraduate Internship Program, were cataloging items that the museum had acquired for its collection in preparation for its online launch. Our intern came upon a bed sheet that had been made by a young girl named Giuseppina Fico, and we all stopped to admire it. We discussed Giuseppina's story and that of the sheep. Giuseppina's mother had died in 1918 during the influenza pandemic. Her father was a sharecropper and the family barely got by. At the age of six, Giuseppina was already helping her father in the fields and had begun preparing her corredo or the linen portion of her dowry. The bed sheet she made when she was 10 years old contains elegant cutwork that reads Bon Riposo, which is Italian for rest well. Giuseppina eventually married and shortly after World War II, she immigrated to the United States. The Bon Riposo bedsheet was among the items she brought with her on the transatlantic journey. Giuseppina settled in New York where she found employment in the garment industry, making apparel for retailers, including Saks Fifth Avenue. Her needlework skills helped put food on the table. The Bon Riposo bedsheet Giuseppina sewed in 1925 remained in the family for 88 years until 2013 when her daughter donated it to the IMLA. Learning about Giuseppina's experiences imparted a new significance to the sheet. And I happened to remark, wouldn't it be neat to do an exhibition of these linens one day? an exhibit that examines the story behind each piece and the women who made them. Our staff liked the concept and we added it to our list of future exhibition ideas. We discovered a couple months later that this concept, needlework as a vehicle for exploring women's stories, was the subject of a very fine book, Embroidered Stories, Interpreting Women's Domestic Needlework from the Italian Diaspora which is a collection of essays edited by folklorist Joseph Shora, director of academic and cultural programs at Calandra Institute, and Sicilian American writer, educator, and literary crit critic, Edvige Junta. We had worked with Joseph in the past on other programs and shared the idea of doing a needlework exhibition with him. He graciously agreed to serve as the advisor on a grant proposal we were in the process of writing to the California Endowment for the Humanities. The book provided some of the framework for the grant and the exhibition, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Joseph Shora, Edvige Junta, and the authors that contributed to the book. Let me, uh, for whatever reason, my screen is, there we go, okay. A few months later, the news we had been waiting for arrived. California Humanities had selected our proposal to be funded. This was our first successful grant proposal to Cal Humanities and we were overjoyed. Then came the pandemic and life changed overnight. We canceled, postponed and rescheduled exhibitions. It was projected that upwards of 40% of the nation's museums would not survive the pandemic. And there were many times when it seemed as if the IMLA's very future was on the line. The museum adapted to the pandemic. We went virtual, presenting dozens of free programs and resources from concerts and lectures to, to curricula and culinary educational videos. These virtual experiences have been enjoyed by over 50,000 people to date. In June of 2021, after more than 400 days, the IMLA was finally able to reopen for in-person visits. We, we decided that Woven Lives would be the first temporary exhibition that the IMLA would present in the quasi post pandemic world. The IMLA issued a call for needlework, asking the public to share pieces created by women of the Italian diaspora that had interesting stories attached to them. Much to our delight and thanks to organizations like the Italian Sons and Daughters of America, which helped publicize the call, people all over the nation responded. We received submissions from Pennsylvania, Michigan, Colorado, 
Florida, New York, Massachusetts, and Colorado, excuse me, and California, as well as from Italy and Australia, we had evidently struck a chord. The public shared over 200 items with us for consideration. There were many fine examples of embroidery, lace, crochet, knitting, needlepoint, and sewing. Much of the needlework was over 100 years old, but it was the stories behind the pieces, the experiences of the women responsible for the needlework that humbled and inspired us the most. Emerging from the uncertainty and chaos of the pandemic, learning about these women, their hardships, and experiences long relegated to the margins was good medicine. It's, we couldn't help but feel strengthened and emboldened by them. Needlework first emerged in Italy during the 13th and 14th centuries. At that time, it was a craft practiced almost exclusively by affluent women whose socioeconomic class enabled them to have time for leisurely activities. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as the Industrial Revolution increased the availability of factory-made textiles, Italian women of more modest means were able to de dedicate less time to creating basic household textiles and more time to fabricating pieces that reflected their artistry. By refining their needlework skills, young women demonstrated that they had been properly educated and possessed the desirable characteristics associated with femininity and domesticity. Because of this, needlework was often performed in public places. Through such displays, young women signaled that they were prepared for adult life. They improved their prospects for marriage and enhanced their social status. By the tender age of seven, girls had typically learned the basics of needlework. As they matured, young women were expected to learn a multitude of stitches and techniques. Their needlework skills were often showcased in samplers or imparatici, which were pieces of cloth on which young women learned to embroider. Imparatici were often passed down from mother to daughter or were distributed at schools where they were used as a teaching tool. At that time, embroidery was part of um, a young woman's curriculum. Uh, this here is an 1890 Imparaticcio that is um, showcased in the exhibition. Young women commonly began creating their corredi, or the textile portion of their wedding trousseaus, by the time they reached elementary school age. The corredo was a significant part of an Italian woman's dowry, and a woman who lacked a corredo was considered undesirable. Uh, this image is, a, is um, from a portion of the exhibition that showcases uh, various items from Corredi. Um, they date from 1921 to about 1997. Between 1870 and 1920, some 14 million Italians, mostly peasants from Italy's south, fled social, economic, and political inequality in what was one of history's largest human migrations. 4 million of the 14 million Italians would settle in the United States. Domestic uh, skills such as sewing, spinning, and needlework would play an integral role in the lives of Italian immigrant women and figure prominently in their migratory experiences. Italian immigrant women discovered that their old world skills had new applications in the United States. They translated their knowledge and of textiles into wage earning employment and became important breadwinners for their families. Upwards of 80% of the nation's Italian immigrant women were employed in the garment industry, a sector that was infamous for its exploitation of workers and labor abuses. Whereas needlework in Italy had been a slow meticulous process, an art form that emphasized quality Employers in the United States favored mass production, quantity, and speed. While most work in Italy had been done by hand, machines were the norm in the United States. The factories in which the women worked, often for 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week, exposed them to various health hazards. In some cases, women experienced catastrophic, life-changing in injuries and even lost their lives. The 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York, 
a disaster that killed 146 garment workers, largely Jewish and Italian women and girls, is one of many tragedies that illustrates the horrific working conditions of the era. Most of the women employed at the factory were immigrants, ranging in age from 14 to 23. They earned between seven and $12 for 52 hours of work a week, which is the equivalent of approximately 191 to $327 uh, today. When the fire broke out on the eighth floor of the building, the workers discovered that the exits had been locked, which was a common practice to prevent theft and prohibit workers from taking breaks. The fire escapes failed. And while some workers managed to escape, many others succumbed to the heat of the blaze uh, or smoke inhalation, while others jumped seven stories to their deaths. The oldest victim was 43-year-old Providenza Pano, the youngest casualties were Kate Leone and Rosaria Maltese, both 14 years old, both 14 years old. The fire generated sympathy for the plight of industrial workers. It produced some safety reforms and inspired many Italian American women to become activists. Many women today, myself included, um, cite the fire as one of the events in history that shaped their consciences early in life. Um, tomorrow is actually the, 100th the 111th anniversary of the fire, and this Sunday on um, March 23rd, where uh, the IMLA will be doing a free program featuring Edvige Junta and Marianne Trashati, whose book, Talking to the Girls, examines the contemporary relevance of the tragedy and serves as a written memorial to the Triangle victims. Uh, let's see. Within one generation, life often changed dramatically for Italian American families. The daughters of immigrants did not follow their mothers into factories most often. For instance, Giuseppina uh, Fico's daughter, Rose, who donated the Bon Riposo bedsheet to the museum, earned a PhD and became a biochemist. As the daughters of immigrant women achieved upward mobility, and as consumerism became the norm following World War II, many women came to regard needlework as, an, as antiquated and uh, oppressive. They chose not to learn needlework, preferring more American and less labor intensive activities. The traditional Italian corredo, uh, items that women had historically made themselves uh, or had been made by kin, such as the elegant cutwork pillow sham pictured here, was gradually replaced by the modern wedding registry, toasters, stand mixers, and the like. Needlework was increasingly relegated to the past. While many of these traditions were lost as a result of our march towards modernity, it was women who also helped preserve these traditions. Uh, women who continue to teach needlework to their daughters and uh, their young people in the community. Uh, these images here represent five generations of needleworkers in a single Los Angeles family. The pink arrow on the left, the black and white photograph, uh, is uh, points to Mary Girillo. Um, uh, on the right, you see the same woman, Mary Girillo, today with her uh, daughter and granddaughter. So um, the, uh, the, the Girillo and Messina family um, were um, legends in the little Italy of Los Angeles where they lived. Uh, they taught uh, women um, how to do stitches, needlework stitches um, that they could then translate into um, employment opportunities. And uh, we showcase uh, some of the, the creations that they made, these little samplers that were passed around to the women of Lincoln Heights and Boyle Heights um, in this exhibition. So the bottom, um, the bottom image is an arrow pointing to a case of these little samplers um, that were again used as, as teaching tools. Uh, within, uh, well, while many of these traditions uh, Oh, I just said that. okay. Um, most of the contributors in the exhibition um, we came to discover were also women, uh, a point that illustrates the important role that women play as the custodians of family history, 
material culture and memories. Um, this was an image taken uh, at the exhibition's opening night, and it captures just you know, a fraction of the many, many contributors uh, that loaned the museum um, items that are currently on display. As we began installing the more than 100 pieces featured in the exhibition, it occurred to me that the Italian-American craftswoman who fabricated the needlework, most of whom have long since passed on, would never have imagined that their creations would one, be, one day be showcased in a museum. We found it fitting to include a photo of each woman and a brief history of their life next to their creations. And it is these same stories that our visitors have connected with most intimately. The stories of women like Antonina Gaudesi Gallio, whose son contracted tuberculosis and was confined to a hospital for more than a year. Three times a week, Antonina rode a trolley out to visit him. And during the long ride, she would crochet elegant handkerchiefs, handkerchiefs to give to the nurses and doctors. Women like Cecilia Scottini, who was her family's primary breadwinner. The term impressive comes to mind when describing her resourcefulness. She saved butcher's twine from packages of meat and repurposed it, crocheting it into pot scrubbers. She made towels out of recycled sugar and flour sacks and then embroidered them as if they were fine cotton. Women like Maria Antonia Cortese, whose husband was an alcoholic and often abusive. Through her needlework, Maria created some of the only objects of beauty her family knew. They described her work as moving meditation. Women like Paulina Di Cristoforo Villani, whose husband immigrated to the US in the early 1930s, planning to send for his family, but World War II soon broke out. And for more than six years, the family remained separated. Amid the bombings, hunger, disease, and uncertainty, Paulina took control of her family and provided for her three children. She lived to be 103 years old. And when her vision failed, she continued crocheting using muscle memory alone. There is little historical record of these women. They never achieved fame or fortune. Their legacy is their perseverance, their love for others, their wisdom and their resourcefulness. It is indeed our honor to shed light on their experiences. And we hope you'll have the opportunity to visit the, the exhibition in person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana. That was a great presentation. Thank you. So let's see, if you all have any questions, um, we got here from Laura in the chat. She just said, I received an embroidered tablecloth napkin set and a fully crocheted bedspread for my Nana on my wedding. Hmm. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? You can either raise your hand through your reactions at the bottom or you can unmute yourself. I think we have a couple of hands raised. Okay, let me see. Yes, I see a hand raised here, but it's not showing me who for some reason. I see it's Ellie Imperato. Yes. Hi. I wondered if there is a book uh, that's been published in conjunction with this exhibit. Unfortunately, not. We just, we are a very small museum and um, with limited resources, uh, but um, we do plan to make a virtual uh, version of the exhibition available online um, in the months to come. And there's of course the, the book, um, uh, Joseph Shora and Advijay Junta's book, which does touch upon and is was really um, uh, provided a lot of the framework for the exhibition, and it would be uh, you know a wonderful resource if if you're looking to um, you know explore some more of these topics. Another question: uh, If uh, what is the latest item? In other words, in terms of when it was uh, done uh, that you have, or are they all in the first part of the twentieth century? 
Well, so I, you know, in, in interest of time, I, um, there's quite a few aspects of the exhibition that I didn't cover. Um, one was uh, there's, you know, um, there's certain, so some of the topics that I didn't include in this presentation included religious needlework, um, the role that um, women, um, that nuns, um, women, clergy women uh, played in uh, transmitting uh, knowledge and preserving needlework traditions. So that's one aspect. Um, I also didn't cover uh, another portion of the exhibition, which examines uh, the role of um, Italian fashion houses today, some of the biggest names in Italian fashion, such as uh, Dolce & Gabbana and Gucci and Missoni, in kind of paying tribute to many of the women who really were um, kind of the, the, the origins of the companies of the fashion houses themselves are connected to these women. So as part of the exhibition, we showcase um, some fashions by uh, Dolce & Gabbana, uh, Fendi, uh, Missoni, um, that kind of illustrate how uh, some of these traditions still continue in Italy. But to get back to your question, um, I, I, would, I think that one of the most recent um, or two of the most recent objects um, are from the 90s. Um, we have a traditional um, borsa or, you know, the purse that many women carried at their, Italian women that is, um, carried at their weddings um, that, you know, envelopes, uh, gifts would, would typically be inserted in. And then we also have a doily um, that comes from the same time period, more or less, that was used to wrap confetti or, you know, often known as uh, Jordan almonds and um, was, you know, a, a, a wedding favor at um, an Italian American wedding. So those are the two, some of the, the most recent items that come to mind. We have a question from, I don't have your name, but I see your email, Kamado. <laughs> yeah, and my name's Carolina Amato. Hi, Carolina, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I was looking for uh, the correct spelling of Corredo, and I think somebody answered me, C-O-R-R-E-D-O. -R -R -E is that correct? Correct. And then the plural is Corredi. So you heard me kind of refer to them back and forth, depending on when I, whether I was speaking the singular or the plural. Oh, okay. And is there, um, and, and what exactly does it, it's a noun and it means um, the actual need. Yeah, Thank so you. it refers to the linen portion of a woman's dowry. So, you know, a woman's dowry could include anything from, you know, property, you know, to animals, to fig trees, to other possessions that might have been given to the family, you know, their, their, their um, bedroom set. And uh, a corredo, um, in, in English, I think the word is borrowed from French, a trousseau. So it refers to the linens um, everything from pillowcases to household towels to even a woman's undergarments uh, that were part of her possessions prior to marrying. Is that a dialect, uh, do you know, or is it actually, because um, I I've, um, just translated it mm -hmm. and um, in my Italian dictionary, it says kit. K-I-T. Hmm. So I'm wondering if it's actually maybe Sicilian dialect. No, I think it, I think there's probably um, a number of applications to the word. Um, um, you know, another way it's commonly referred to in Italian is biancheria, which literally translates to like white wear. And, yeah, you know, white, mm -hmm. yeah, white carrying like, you know, the implications of virginity and purity, uh, as well as like, you know, typically the household linens were often white or off white. So corredo is the a proper Italian word. I think it just, it probably has a lot of different meanings and, and applications. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, Leslie has her hand raised. Go ahead, Leslie. Hi, everyone. This is Leslie Giuliotti with the DC chapter. Um, I had a question for you. You mentioned that you have a couple of pieces that are from the last 20 to 30 years. Um, are those those women that made the pieces? Um, is it a 
a craft that they are teaching to others? Is it something where they are carrying it on themselves? Do you know how they actually learn the skill, whether it be tatting or uh, bobbin lace making or um, another type of embroidery? So the most recent pieces, um, and I, I'm, I might be, you know, forgetting a few, but the two that came to mind that I, I mentioned, the doily and the borsa, um, the doily was made by a woman who has since passed on, and I can't state with certainty whether she imparted um, her skills to anyone else. But the borsa um, was made by uh, the family I mentioned in the exhibition, excuse me, in the presentation, um, the Girillo D'Agostaro family um, who live here in Los Angeles. These are the five generations of, um, of needle workers. And so, um, uh, uh, Teresa, who's, um, it was her wedding purse, um, she has taught um, uh, embroidery needlework to her daughters, along with her mother, um, the woman who was seen both in the 1940s and in the present. Uh, so it carries on. Um, interestingly, I also share with you that the museum is hosting two workshops on lace making, um, one later this month and one in May. And almost immediately after we announced them, they were sold out. And we actually added a second one um, because we you know, received more than 85 responses to the first. So it seems like there is interest there. And um, you know, maybe uh, it, you know, these are things that um, need to be sought out, um, but it does seem a bit encouraging that um, people are you know, carrying this on or rediscovering uh, the, um, the skills, the traditions of their ancestors. Okay, Laura has her hand up. Hi, how are, how's everybody? Maria, that was just spectacular. I was just so excited when I saw that uh, this was happening because embroidery, uh, lace making, and also beading was a big part of my family's life. And in fact, when the Met had a show several, a few years back, there was a piece that um, my grandmother's sister did because as you know, in Italian families and in villages, uh, oftentimes women did not necessarily, particularly in families, they didn't have the same skill sets because they had to spread it out. So my grandmother was the embroiderer and her sister was the beater, just like my grandmother made the eggplant rollatini and her and her sister uh, made the arancini. So there were, you know, they had to have different skills. And I, I just found this to be so fascinating because uh, you know, all four of my grandparents, um, two were Italian and two weren't, but they were all craftspeople. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather, my Italian grandfather was a watchmaker. And, I, you know, it's really, I, I think that this is all coming back now. I, I don't know if that's why you had, you had so much response, but certainly when I grew up, it would have been considered a bad thing to be mm -hmm. a craftsperson. You know, you had to go to college and you had to, you, nobody, and now I think people are getting, are, are frantic to get uh, back to that. And I mean, frantic in, in a good way, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, and I, I see that Julie Ireland asked if you're still accepting pieces, because as we were on the phone, I texted my, my cousin, because I know we have a piece that my grandmother did that is probably uh, 10 feet high and eight feet wide. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an embroidery of the tree of life. Wow. It's, it's spectacular. So I, is this a permanent exhibit? Like, do I have to fly out to LA today to see it? <laughs> okay, so to answer a, a few questions at once, um, some of the items, in a showcase in the exhibition are from our permanent collection. Many of them are on loan. This exhibition continues until October of this okay. year. There has been some interest for, of, um, for it to travel, um, but I don't have any definite, you know, um, locations to share with you yet. Um, it we would love for it to maybe, you know, come to the East Coast um, where I know there's quite a bit of interest in it. 
So, um, to, but to go to your other question, um, we are not accepting pieces for this exhibition, but we would be potentially accepting pieces for our permanent collection. Um, if the exhibition travels and it goes to a place that may have you know, more space um, than we did, um, there would be the potential to bring in additional items, of course, um, whether it's a loan or a donation. So um, there's, uh, you're welcome, to, I can put my contact information in the chat. And um, if, if you'd like, you know, you're welcome to reach out. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you really thank you. made, you made my, uh, my week, my oh, month, well, my God year. You that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Zita has her hand raised. Go ahead, Zita. Hi, everyone. Um, I am one of the people who contributed to the exhibition um, on behalf of my beautiful Nana, Paulina. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> anyway, I just want to thank uh, Mariana for this incredible exhibit. I live in Los Angeles. I'm a member of the IMLA. Um, recently found about it and it's just a spectacular venue. If any of you are ever in the LA area, um, you should definitely check it out. Um, but I just want to give my personal thanks to Mariana for this exhibit and also on behalf of any Italian American women, uh, all of us here and certainly so many others who can relate to this um, unspoken topic, you know, a topic that isn't discussed a lot and um, the strength and beauty and skill of these women um, is something we should admire and cherish. And um, that's what this exhibit is doing. So I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you, Sita. I mean, honestly, um, it's stories like your grandmother's that just really you know, I, I almost felt like, you know, I, I, I didn't want to seem too, you know, woo woo as they say, <laughs> in just doing this presentation. But I mean, I, while we were putting together this exhibition, you know, and this is at the heels of the pandemic and just all this uncertainty. And, you know, it, it felt at certain times like these women's stories found us that we didn't find them, that there was some, you know, um, hand that was kind of guiding this and it was we kind of developed like a this spiritual connection with some of these women and their stories where you just like wow you know everything that we've all gone through you know these women did as well so a lot of times worse and they had fewer options and you know um in many respects they helped make our lives possible so it was just one of those kind of acknowledgement and um, just tremendous respect for these women so thank you and I'm sorry if I interrupted you Zita <laughs> no no not at all my my pleasure to, to hear I just wanted to thank you and also um, I think I contributed a piece that was from about the year 2000 that um, Nana had made for me when my son was born in 2001 so she Thank started you. at Thank it you for was... was that <laughs> is that was... the um just so everybody knows if you if you saw in the presentation the the yellow and green bikini the kind of crochet well bikini. no that was earlier in my life before I was uh, pregnant <laughs> <laughs> well no that was your grandma but there was a point that I was yeah. trying to make which we were just like yes. you know it's just a very modern kind of interpretation yes. of you know so which, which which I I thought kind of also um, demonstrates how, you know, these women, they weren't just crocheting doilies anymore. They were crocheting items that were very practical and that were stylish and that, you know, their granddaughters would want to wear. Right. So I would yes. have loved to have known your grandmother. Yes. She was spectacular as, as well. I'm sure many of the ancestors of everyone here and yours as well. Um, yeah. She always kept up with fashion and the time she was very interested in current events and what was happening in the world, especially in, in the world of fashions. And, and she tried to adapt her crocheting over the years uh, to keep up with that as well. She was very interested in it. <laughs> so thank you so much for, oh, no, for this you. exhibition. All right, Diana has a question. I think Diana's muted. All right. Ask her to unmute. I actually had a question. This is Carolina again. Um, can you discuss at all preservation? Because it's I, I, it seems like many of us have beautiful linens from our grandparents or great grandparents. 
And I have a box full of beautiful things. Um, one thing in particular, which is so lovely, it's um, a pillow cover and it says Sempre Felice. Mm. It kind of reminded me of the one that you had, uh, Sweet Dreams or whatever it was, I don't remember now, but I, 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 I just don't know how to preserve them. And I, I'm, I've saved this now for, since my grandmother passed away, like 50 years ago in a box and I want them to last a long time. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? So, okay, so I won't claim to be, you know, a, um, an expert preservationist by any means, but, you know, as um, being in the museum industry, there's certain basic things that you can do to preserve your textiles. You know, one is obviously, um, keep them, if there's color, um, you know, keep them away from light, um, like direct sunlight, um, try to keep them in a, in a place that's temperate where the temperature doesn't fluctuate tremendously. Um, you don't typically want to store them in plastic. You know, plastic heats up and it releases gases and that can affect, you know, whatever is being stored in it. Um, the best thing to purchase, you know, you can go online and get some acid-free tissue paper and an acid-free box. Uh, you can do like just a simple search on Amazon for, um, you know, archival boxes, archival tissue, and, um, you know, wrap your items uh, in um, tissue, put them in a, in a box that doesn't have, you know, acid and other chemicals. And then, of course, if, you know, um, if the items contain wool, um, you, you know, storing them with cedar or something else to prevent, prevent pest infestations um, is also to be advised. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank My you. Pleasure. So if Diana is unable to unmute herself, she did post. Oh, I think she's there. I hear you go. Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, good to see you, Mariana. It's uh, been a long time since we chatted. You know, only recently, I moved to Washington, D.C. from uh, New Jersey, and uh, I put all the stuff that my mother had in, in drawers in boxes. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking at some of it. And um, there are, um, there's like a, a bedspread in a, in a beigey color. There are sheets and all kinds of things. And I, I don't, I don't know. I think they're part of her wedding trousseau, which mm -hmm. was like 80 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how to identify them. I, I, and ironically today, I went to see a friend of mine at her store and she has one of these uh, stores that have all these imported uh, bedspreads and sheets and things like that. And I said to her, and you know what I could do with this stuff <laughs> because it's nice, but I don't want to just dump it and give it to anybody. You know, I'd like to see it preserved somewhere. Uh, she mentioned a consignment store that handles a lot of expensive stuff but uh you know I, i'm sort of in the dark you know i don't have, know how to identify it I, it's it's beautiful it's pretty i don't know what it is like the and actual items is it one particular item or it's... yeah they're uh and they have the ricordo on it and uh all that uh and i i just would like to i would give it to a museum i actually when i moved here gave some to the New York uh, Italian American Museum. I, I don't know if anything was ever exhibited. Uh, I even sent wedding pictures. But, um, you know, I, I just, if anybody has any ideas, I would like to hear them. I'm in Washington, DC. Um, well, I mean, sometimes size can throw you off because Italian sizes were different, of, you know, their, their pillow shams yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, you know, there's, there might be more decorative items that, uh, we don't use today because we've kind of simplified our lives in certain respects. Well, that's what I think. Um, you know, we very pretty, for instance, this fantastic runner. It's like a bed runner that was, um, kind of either put at the, the end of the bed or that went on top of the pillow oh, pillows yeah. that were already in shams. And, um, so 
but if you know if you'd like to share a photo and dimensions we might be able to help decode it i i can't i won't claim to be an expert in terms yeah, of, yeah i i you know. know and i wish i somebody had told me uh you know when i was a kid it was just a matter of all these things were beautiful and my mother kept them in this drawer yeah. uh, well anyway great presentation i really uh thank you Found it very informative. Thank you, thank you. All right, does anyone else have any more questions? It looks like Mariana did put in the uh, email address and website for IMLA if you guys uh, want any more information and to reach out. And if, you know, if there's a, a venue, you know, if there's a serious interest in bringing this and, you know, you have connections through your various organizations to a venue, um, you know, please let us know. Again, there was some interest in bringing it to New York. It's just a matter of, you know, ironing out those details. Definitely. Well, you know, um, I hope I'm not interrupting. Uh, Washington, D.C. just set up a, uh, an Italian-American museum. I think someone contacted you. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and I'm bringing a group there in June, but I went over to see it. And they really did a, a, a wonderful job in a vet, not a very large space, but maybe there's a, a way of doing something that I could ask them. Sure, certainly. Okay, Maria. Okay, first and foremost, I wanna thank Mariana uh, on behalf of our organization and all of uh, those who participated. It was an excellent, excellent talk, Mariana. And you're making me definitely want to get back to LA. <laughs> you got to come visit us. Yeah, and get to your museum. But you really made this special and that you were willing to partner with us in this. Uh, oh, of course. We really appreciate it. Very, very. Anytime. Much. It's, you know, I really, I, um, I look forward to doing more with Noya. And if, um, if there's ever an opportunity to do something on the West Coast, um, to do a, you know, a meeting out here, I realize it involves travel, you know, long travel for many of you, but consider us a collaborator. So thank you. I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you who participated tonight. Um, please check our website for upcoming programs and our luncheon, our major fundraiser of the year is on May 5th. Check that out as well. We're honoring uh, Patty Lapone and two other really wonderful people. So um, I thank you on behalf of Noel for joining us. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Grazie.